Every bit of data I've ever seen tells me your consciousness is a, the sum of chemical and electrical impulses. Get over it. I think there's something weird happening. It's physical, though. I'm damn yes. sure it's physical. I'm damn sure that there's nothing going on in my head other than what is allowed by the laws of nature as we understand them. Do you have a soul? No, really. Do you? From Voldemort splitting his soul into the Horcruxes, to the Soul Stone in the Avengers, souls are everywhere in popular culture. And with good reason. A soul is something that most of us grow up thinking that we have. Even if you're not religious, most people have an identity, a self beyond our body. We like to think that we have bodies, not that we are bodies. If someone says, don't you have a soul? You'd be offended at the idea that you're just an unfeeling robot. And yet, if you ask many establishment scientists if we have a soul, they'll say, no. Even the secularized version of the soul, the mind, a non-material consciousness, able to influence the world around it, is something that many scientists deny. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, writes in his 1994 book, The astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have put it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. This idea is a core part of the materialist worldview, the idea that matter and energy is all that exists. Materialists call this idea epiphenomenalism. Epi, outer, phenomenon, effect. The idea is that our minds are a kind of outer effect or side effect of our brain. Like the gastric juice that our stomach produces, first-person subjective experience of the world is a quirky side effect of the electrical activity in our brains. Our neurons produce our consciousness. Free will is an illusion. And even if our brains didn't have the side effect of consciousness, our empty zombie bodies would still be here, going about in the world, and the world would look no different. This is quite literally the scientific establishment's view of the soul or mind. It denies our conscious agency because saying that a personal soul can affect the material world makes us wonder whether there could also be a god who is affecting the material world too. Since god is a no-no, souls are kept in the closet, and epiphenomenalism is the new watchword. There's just uh, one problem, it's obviously complete rubbish. You see, the idea that brain states produce mental states doesn't make any sense. We know what the brain is and what it's made of. It's made of neurons, nerve cells. These carry electrical impulses from one place to another. How do they do this? By the movement of sodium and potassium ions across a membrane producing an electrical gradient. There are many different types of brain cells and they come in different shapes and sizes, but they're basically all pretty similar. Some kind of fatty lipid membrane enclosing some fluid with lots of biochemical structures thrown in. Chemicals and proteins move about and things happen. Can I get my PhD yet? Here's the thing. There is an insurmountable gap between electrical impulses going from one nerve cell to another and conscious experience of the world. For instance, take vision. Light hits your retina, which sends signals down your optic nerves. These go down different pathways back to your visual cortex. We know in detail how this happens. But there's a big difference between electrical signals moving in your brain and the experience of sight. Why does an impulse going from your eye to the squishy brain cells near the back of your head give you the experience of seeing the face of someone you love, or the sunrise, or the ocean? The same goes for hearing. We know how sound waves hit your eardrum and how these are conducted to your inner ear and onto your auditory cortex. But how does this let you hear the cry of your newborn baby, or hear the sound of music that moves you to tears? Then take thought and reason. We know that they are strongly associated with the frontal cortex. We can see the electrical signals bounce around. But how does this produce imagination, logical deduction? After all, in principle, there is no real difference between your brain cells and a chemical solution from your school chemistry class. Of course, Brain cells are incredibly complex, with amazing molecular machines. But it doesn't matter how complex your biochemical systems are, the same problem will occur again. 
If the electrical signal that runs your bedroom light isn't conscious, then why is the electrical circuit in our head conscious? This is known as the explanatory gap between the physical brain stuff and conscious experience. It's a pretty big gap. In fact, it's completely unbridgeable. It's not just something that will be solved by better analysis of the brain. By better characterising sodium ions, we're not suddenly going to realise, oh yeah, and when the sodium ion moves like that, you get first person experience of conscious reality. Sodium is pretty cool, right? You see, in principle, it is inconceivable how physical states produce mental states. Now that leaves an obvious inference, that physical brain states don't produce mental states that mental states are produced by something completely different, and that maybe this non-material source of consciousness is something that we'd call the soul. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, our mental state is affected by our brain state. This is seen if we take drugs, don't get enough sleep, or have a brain injury of some kind. But just because the brain is deeply linked with our mental state doesn't mean it produces the mind. If my watch moves at the same time as my hand, that doesn't mean that my watch is the one that's producing the movement, my hand is. In the same way, if our brain shows activity simultaneous with conscious experience, that doesn't mean it is directly producing that experience. In fact, the same kind of brain injuries that tell us the brain is linked with the mind also tell us that the brain doesn't produce the mind. If conscious experience was produced by certain brain cells, then if we get rid of those brain cells, we should get rid of consciousness, right? Well, we can get rid of brain cells. People have strokes and brain surgery all the time. Pretty much any part of the brain can be taken out and consciousness will continue. Brain cells can affect conscious experience, but they do not seem to produce it. In fact, research into neuroplasticity often tells us the opposite. After people have strokes or brain injuries, they go into neuro rehab. This is a facility that specifically tries to retrain the remaining brain to take on new functions with effort and practice. And guess what? It works. Patients are able to change the functions of their brain tissue. The brain is malleable, and in many cases, it follows the direction of mental effort. So where does that leave us? We know that our common conception of matter cannot explain consciousness. This means that the standard materialist view of nature, as championed by Richard Dawkins, Brian Cox, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, is false. Matter alone cannot explain the consciousness of living beings. This means that there has to be something else that produces consciousness. This is what we would traditionally call the soul, a non-material source of consciousness that is able to influence the world around us. It is obviously linked with the brain, but that doesn't mean it is produced by the brain. It simply means that they both interact to produce your mental state. But if the source of consciousness isn't the brain, and is independent of individual brain cells, then perhaps it can survive the death of the brain. Perhaps this consciousness, this soul, can live on and transcend into some other form of being. Perhaps spiritual experiences can occur when a universal consciousness, God, communicates with our consciousness. And perhaps in the same way we have neuroplasticity, we also have spiritual plasticity. Perhaps the way we act can affect the health of our soul, for better or worse. As the Holy Quran says, by the soul and its perfection, he truly prospers who purifies it, and he who corrupts it is ruined. Can you feel those materialists getting uncomfortable? All this is to say that you do have a soul, your mind is real, and that you have the greatest superpower imaginable. You can bend matter to your will. But remember, with great power, great responsibility. Excelsior! Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe to Rational Religion by clicking the red button below. Also, don't forget to like and comment letting us know whether you think you have a soul or whether you think the brain is enough.